Okay, welcome back students. Uh, we go into the next chapter that we're going to be focusing on in our human resources management uh, module, which is a chapter dedicated to the concepts of uh, training and development and learning. We have distinctively made them uh, separate uh, for a reason because though some of them are used interchangeably, um, there is a distinction that should be drawn in how we use the term and their meaning particularly. So you'll find a lot of this distinction coming out in some of the examples and also the uh, content that's going to be uh, presented. This is an important chapter largely because it concerns issues related to skilling of people. Um, if you remember in chapter one we spoke about the importance of the knowledge economy. So one of the things that's critical here is trying to understand how is it that we arrive to the knowledge economy. We arrive to the knowledge economy through paying attention to, and not limited to rather, um, issues such as training of people, how people develop, and aspects of learning, which is what I hope we are also doing as part of this engagement in this, in this module. As always, you know the drill. Um, the module always starts with introducing you to a range of learning outcomes. Let's look at the three learning outcomes that we have here. Uh, use an effective training and development process to ensure the ongoing, not once off, ongoing improvement of the skills, knowledge and values of employees as part of their management uh, of performance. Number two, manage the training and development requirements of an organization in which the National Qualifications Framework, otherwise known as the NQF, the Skills Development Act, otherwise known as the SDA, and the Skills Development Levies Act, SDLA, and how they link with issues of training, development, and learning. And then finally, manage knowledge creation and utilization in an organization through effective and efficient organizational learning. So let's dig straight into it. And in coming to the highlight, I think, of what this module is about, it's also the ability for you as a student to be able to distinguish and critique um, and provide distinction and critique around concepts and terms that we often use. This is a very common question we like to ask, that you provide us a distinction of those facets of training, education, and development. So let's look at each and every one of them in perspective and also give an example. Let's start with the issue of training. This is really an attempt to alter. If it's an attempt, that means it can be successful, or it might not be successful, an attempt to alter or change the knowledge, skills, behavior of employees in such a way that the organizational objectives are achieved. And remember, constantly throughout the module, we've been saying that it's not just about organizational objectives. It's also about making sure that individuals benefit to this entire process. So what we're trying to do here is to find ways through um, training to change behavior, to change what people know, to change the skills that people have so that they achieve some form of objective related to their individual pursuits or the organization. The second facet is education, which is really um, a process of ensuring that we provide knowledge, skills, and moral values and understanding required in a normal course of life and focused on developing people for the future. And this, this is what higher education institutions like the University of Forte are doing. This is what TVET colleges are trying to do. This is what the education system is trying to do at a, at a formative uh, level. This is what distance learning is trying to achieve. And so the aim here is just imparting some form of knowledge, skills, and moral values that we then hope will help you develop in your future. I want to comment a bit on the issue of moral values, which is a subject of contention. Can we impart those? Because uh, what, who deems what is moral or not? And this is an interesting issue of ongoing debate as well. Ultimately, 
what we can arrive to here are commonly held universal principles that are deemed to be moral values. For instance, respect of life. Um, that, I hope, is a common value that all of us should and attain to have. Finally, development focuses more on the longer term perspective, which is creating learning opportunities that make um, uh, it possible for an organization through training and education to be able to achieve their uh, objectives. And it's more long term based rather than um, short time based or short term based in terms of uh, timelines as would be training and education. Going further, we then introduce you to a very, very important process, which is called the training and development process. Um, the training and development process really is a structured way of trying to say, how do we instill those that knowledge, the, how do we instill the skills, how do we instill the behaviors into a grouping of people? And um, this is set in a format of four steps. However, the four steps are not meant to be um, set in stone, one after the other. You'll actually find they actually feed into each other. That is why what you see there is um, an attempt of trying to put it in a very um, systematic process, which with one process linking with the other. So the first of those is to identify the training and development needs, otherwise known as a needs analysis. These needs can be positioned at two levels. The first of these level is at an organizational level, and the second of these levels is at an individual level. What we need to be asking here is the important question. What is it that we are trying to achieve informed by the gaps in terms of what we are doing as an organization or in terms of what we are doing as and or what our individuals are doing in forms of uh, their attainment as part of the process of employment. And this feeds into understanding different sources of information. Uh, we can use uh, objective measures of trying to get uh, uh, an understanding of these needs, or we can use subjective measures where we go and sit down with people and actually ask them what are their needs. And after we found out the needs, for instance, we found out that the guys in production are struggling with a, uh, using a particular machine. We then go to the second step, which is to formulate the training objectives and design on paper some form of a program to try and help us to help those guys in production. Now, ideally what happens in this phase is usually to put things onto pa on paper first to try and write down what are the objectives that we are trying to achieve. And it's easier then when the training intervention is over to say, have our objectives been met? Have we achieved that which we were trying to achieve? And so with <clears throat> program design and development, we are sitting down to actually then say, these are the needs at an individual level. These are the needs at an organizational level. These are types of objectives we're trying to let the training program achieve. And we're going to put everything on paper and somehow find a way of trying to solve this through training and development. This leads us to the third phase, which is choosing the appropriate training and development uh, delivery mode, choosing the appropriate training and de de delivery method. Now, this involves sitting down and trying to say, based on the needs that we have, based on the objectives that we formulated, what is the best way that we can have what we call transfer of learning? What is it that we can do to make an environment conducive that those that are in need of the training will be able to benefit from that training? So we have to choose from a range of different training and development methods and delivery modes. Now, I would advise you to um, look into your textbook as your textbook provides a range of these training and development methods, some of them on site some of them off-site, some of them using a facilitator, some of them using um, just engagement with learning material, a number of different training development methods and delivery uh, modes exist. What you need to do is to try and determine based on 
the needs analysis based on the objectives that you want to achieve what would be the best method of training so for instance if people are learning how to drive a simulation would be good where they get into a simulated environment where they actually learn hands-on but however with some other things uh, where training is needed where let's say maybe there's just cerebral knowledge that is needed you can opt for more um, softer, if you like, methods of ensuring that training has happened. And now this is the part where the training is actually presented and people can now uh, uh, take part in a process of acquiring the necessary knowledge skills that, are, that they need to be able to achieve those objectives. After the training has been done, the last phase is then to evaluate the training and development and then follow it up. I mean, if we can't measure it, then we can't use it. If we can't be able to measure the impact of the training, then it's pointless to be engaged in the process of trying to train employees uh, for a process that they need to learn or an activity that they need to learn. So we then evaluate subjectively, which is through one-on-one -on -one engagement qualitatively, or objectively, which is more quantitative based to try and get a, great, a greater feel of what's happening here. I mean, the text talks about the work of people like Donald Kirkpatrick, who, who, talk, who highlight the importance of reactionaires to try and assist employees in um, understanding their reactions towards interventions of uh, training being given. We can also have training targeted at managers and supervisors. That's more um, at a managerial and a supervisory level. This is a process of educating and developing selected employees because they are a, sect co a selected cohort uh, so that they have the knowledge, the skills and attitudes and understanding needed to be able to manage or supervise specifically. So we can as uh, actually ascertain the needs that they have. Remember the, the process, the four processes, the second one, the needs that they have, the gaps that there is in the organization concerning training of such people. And then we tailor pack, make a package which is suited to this level of um, supervisory or managerial um, function. The objectives of management development uh, or management related interventions are to ensure long term success. So we've been talking about this a lot about strategic focus. We're aiming to present also managerial obsolence, which is the idea that uh, we need managers that are constantly up to date with the daily happenings of what is happening in the organization. We don't want managers whose skills are not relevant to the workforce because they then become a liability to the very same workforce. We need to ensure that there are competent replacements for managerial and supervisory vacancies if at all they exist. Creating efficient team structures whose members work well together to achieve objectives. And finally, enable these managers that we are trying to train to create the necessary context of employees to fulfill their potential within the wider organization. So we, we can ascertain training development opportunities to be also linked not just to frontline employees, but also to assist those employees who are managers. An important question. So what is the benefit of training and development? I think I would also advise you to go and read these in the book. What I've done here is just to put all of them in the slide so that you can see. We identify a range of benefits. It's not enough. Let me repeat this. It's not enough to just write these benefits. They must be accompanied by some form of an explanation. They must be accompanied by some form of an explanation. Increased customer satisfaction. Ultimately, if you go back to chapter one, where we spoke about the service profit chain, what we need to be improving on is customer satisfaction. We need benefit, the benefits to be realized for the individual and for the organization. The possibility of then managing expectations of employees. Research also shows a number of employees leave organizations if they perceive their organization not to be offering training and development opportunities to their benefit. So we try to reduce turnover by allowing opportunity to uh, managers or, or employees to be trained. 
reducing or lowering breakages, the amount of damages that may happen to equipment, to be able to reduce costs creating from wastage, to reduce the need to dismiss workers because of things like incapacity, the inability to be able to do the job. So what you need to do here is to look at all of these in perspective and offer an explanation for each and every one of these as a possible benefit to training and development. We can ask this as a nice 15 mark question where you can identify five benefits and then provide some a bit of an explanation and I advise you to consult the text on, 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 on this section. However, as we have said, training and development, like any function of the human resources component, must be linked to legislation. And we, in your learning outcomes, when we started, we singled out the National Qualifications Framework, the Skills Development Act, and the skills development levy as important, important instruments of legislation that link with training and development. Let's first look at the first one, which is the National Qualifications Framework, otherwise known as the NQF. The NQF is created as an instrument that is aiming to integrate all forms of learning achievements that are happening within um, the context of a country that we're operating in. It aims to facilitate access to and the mobility of progression within education so that when one person moves from one level of education to the other, there is recognition that this person is competent, competent enough based on this achievement that they've done. So the instrument that is used to try and ascertain this level of competence allowing for mobility is through the NQF. It also enhances the quality of our education and training opportunities that are given to um, um, employees and uh, employers as well. It also accelerate, accelerates the repatriation, uh, reparation of past unfair discrimination, particularly in education. It recognizes where we're coming from and seeks to also offer opportunities such as recognition of prior learning and putting people at the same wavelength as the others. And finally, contributes to the full personal development of each learner in view of their socio-economic development and the broader agenda of what is happening within the country. The NQF has uh, been embedded within quality councils. These quality councils are used as um, units that are able or that are able to assist in the functioning of the NQF, higher education institutions like us, the University of Forte, general and further training um, um, uh, instruments that allow for things like formal schooling, adult basic education, and finally trade and occupation um, uh, units which are really uh, located and embedded within aspects of the Skills Development Act. So the ultimate aim that we have of the Skills Development Act is really to develop the workforce of the country to be able to make sure that if you go back to chapter one, that the knowledge-based economy that we are trying to attain is realized through um, a reliable pool of skill th that functions together, not just for individual benefit, not just for organizational benefit, but ultimately benefiting the entire country. To be able to increase the level of investment that we have in education and training, to encourage employers to be able to use their workplace as an active learning environment, not just for seeking of profit, but to also encourage the development of skills, to provide employees with the opportunity to develop those skills and to be able to be useful to the labor market, to encourage workers to be part of a process of participating in activities such as learnerships and other training programs, to improve employment prospects, especially of previously disadvantaged individuals who remain a priority within the South African context in trying to elevate them to a state of equity, to assist workers to find work, retrained workers to be able to enter back the labor market, and employers to be able to find qualified employees to be able to work for them. In essence, the Skills Development Act regulates the entire uh, employment uh, context in terms of the inputs, processes, and outputs related to skills. Concerning organizational learning, it's really a concept that is being used in um, contemporary society 
to refer to the knowledge economy and how we move away from a manufacturing-based type of um, orientation to a service-based orientation, in which the ultimate aim is the creation, the use, and the management of knowledge as a central unit in assisting the development of employees. We can define knowledge as a fluid concept. In other words, it's not readily in packaged condition of saying this is what it is. It modifies itself according to the context and the, the, the situation that it's presented in. Ultimately, it originates and is applied in the minds of those who know for the purpose of achieving benefit through routines, processes, practices, and norms. These then become critical in framing this concept which we have looked at called knowledge learning. Knowledge is created through four main ways. Socialization, which talks about the interaction that we have with others. Articulation, which talks about how we express ideas and innate thoughts and feelings outside. A combination of these factors. And also internalization, what we take in and being able to process that as we uh, seek to function as uh, human beings. And then ultimately, this also links to organizational learning. So organizations like individuals also learn, which is basically looking at how we develop new knowledge and how these insights potentially influence how individual behaviors turn about. So as you as an, as an individual learn, realize also an organization is also a unit, an entity that also learns in the process of creating new knowledge that helps in its in its functioning. So in essence, this is um, this chapter on training and development, highlighting some important issues about understanding the different instruments that exist in terms of the Skills Development Act, highlighting also the National Qualifications Framework. The funding of skills is done through the Skills Development Levies Act, which you can read about in the text but also looking at the benefits that training and development affords, not just the individual, but also the organization. And finally, a critical component being the distinction of those concepts, particularly also looking at it from the framing of the training development process. See you in the next class.